Are you struggling to understand what you're supposed to do with MTHFR gene mutation, meaning how much methylfolate should you take? How quickly should you get to that dose? And what about the alternatives like CME, TMG, etc.? My name is Dr. Taranella, and I'm going to apply my 10 plus years treating people with MTHFR to this question. Mostly in this video, we're going to lean on my clinical experience treating MTHFR and all the positives and negatives that people sometimes run into when they're trying to optimize their health through genetics and, and using things like the MTHFR gene alteration. As I said, my name is Dr. Taranella, and this channel is dedicated to helping you optimize, understand, and improve your health. In this video, we're talking about MTHFR gene mutation treatment options. If you're liking these videos and getting a lot out of these, click on that like and subscribe to continue getting videos like this one. All right, let's jump into the video. <laughs> The problem with MTHFR gene mutation treatments are that oftentimes they're a kind of cookie cutter approach, a one size fits all. And in my clinical experience over the last 16 years or so, this just isn't how the human body tends to work. There's always subtle differences and sometimes overt differences in how people handle different substances. And that is greatly tied in with their genetics, but it's not only the genetics that are determining this. So for instance, a lot of times people will We'll ask the question, I have homozygous C677T and I also have heart palpitations and anxiety. What should I do? Or I have compound heterozygous MTHFR and I have fibromyalgia and depression for the last 10 years. What should I do? Or I have compound heterozygous MTHFR gene alteration and I also have digestive issues and anxiety. What should I do? Are each of these things actually separate? Do we need to? tease apart each layer of this? And if so, how are we going to do this? So for instance, are we going to give someone with MTHFR gene alteration the same exact approach, no matter what is going on with their health, what is going on with their genetics, what is going on with their labs, or might it be better to customize a little bit for what's going on with their genetics, maybe what's going on with their health symptoms, signs that they have going on, signs being lab results. We probably want to have three, four, five, or six of these different shapes for each different type of MTHFR gene alteration kind of person that we might see. So instead of looking at 10 or even five different approaches, we're just going to narrow it down and look at two, maybe three different ways to approach this. That way you get the framework of a cookie cutter without all the nuance, complexity, and confusion that comes with treating MTHFR gene alteration. So I think, yes, you do need to tease these apart, at least somewhat, because we don't want to give someone the same treatment that has homozygous for C677T versus someone else that has heterozygous for 1298C. These are kind of on the opposite spectrum in terms of what you might expect someone to need in terms of their methylfolate. Equally, you know, if you have maybe one or two symptoms that are kind of geared mostly towards not enough folate, like depression and fatigue, you might want to push on that a little bit more versus someone that has a whole host of problems. Giving them lots of methylfolate could disturb their already disturbed system even more. So what we want to do is break up the MTHFR into different phenotypes. So there's going to be two or three different categories, if you will, of patients that I'm going to describe. And then we'll look at some treatment options for at least one, if not two of these types, subtype or phenotype of MTHFR. And part of the way we're going to categorize these subtypes is based on one, your genetics, your signs and symptoms, like what kind of things are you experiencing in terms of your health issues and also lab metrics. But these are just some of the things that may influence whether or not you need more or less methyl donors and specifically methylfolate. And this is just how I approach this problem of treating people with MTHFR when they have very little health issues. And then on the other end of that spectrum is people that have a lot of health issues. How do we sort through those and what kinds of clues can we get about what what moves we can make when you have a lot of problems versus very little problems. Okay, so the first thing that I think about when considering treatment for MTHFR is like, what are your actual genetics? So if you have homozygous SNP for C677T or compound heterozygous for meaning one copy of the 1298C and one copy of the C677T, that usually means that your body is in need of more methylfolate. It has an inability or decreased ability to make methylfolate. So there's a greater chance 
of a deficiency in your body and therefore a greater chance that you're going to benefit from it. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. Yes, there are other genetic alterations that may also benefit from this similar strategy and you can kind of adapt and apply it to this. The other thing in terms of the first type of phenotype that we're going to describe, which again is kind of more on this side of the spectrum in terms of symptoms, is that they don't have a lot of anxiety. They don't have a lot of digestive issues. They're not having a lot of sleep issues. They don't have inflammation in their body, which I know can mean a lot of different things for different people, but specifically that they're not having autoimmune disease and that their lab metrics like their C-reactive protein, their platelets, sedimentation rate, and other indicators of inflammation are not elevated. So again, the first subtype, all of these things are going to be absent. Then on this side of the spectrum, we can call this the second subtype just to make it simple. But of course, there's probably 10 different subtypes that we can discuss. This one is going to be more likely to get worse from taking methylfolate. And they're going to be the person that has all of these things that this person doesn't have. They do have a tendency more towards anxiety, sleep issues, trouble staying asleep, trouble falling asleep. They do have autoimmune disease. They do have digestive issues. They do have more signs of inflammation in their blood, in their tissues. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that this person can't or shouldn't take methylfolate or any methyl donors. That's not the, that's not the uh, answer here. The answer is more so how aggressive we are, how quickly we escalate the dose. All right, so let's shift gears now into focusing on what we would do in a person like this, how the dose naturally increases and where we might end up in terms of methylfolate dosing. So if you've made it this far in the video, you're probably asking yourself, okay, how do I actually treat this? So that's what we're going to dive into now. So when you have, again, this is the phenotype where they don't have a lot of symptoms, these symptoms that I laid out, and they do have a significant genetic alteration there, which I described earlier. And so the, the way that I approach this, most of the time I'm doing labs ahead of time where we look at things like MCV, homocysteine, and B12. And these are going to help us understand how much maybe this person needs and how much it changes over the course of the treatment as well is also helpful to know. Here we're going to focus mostly on what you might do as your starting methylfolate and some other things, how the dose is going to escalate. So for this particular subtype of MTHFR gene alteration, week one is going to look like maybe going to be about one milligram of methylfolate per day for the course of seven days, maybe even two weeks. And typically you're going to want to pair that with vitamin B12 because they work together in order to turn homocysteine into methionine. And if you don't have enough of the B12 in your body, you're going to get folate trapping and can cause a bunch of symptoms that you may negatively attribute to the methylfolate. So we two through four, you're going to increase the dose of methylfolate. We may do an additional milligram for the first week and then add an additional milligram in that fourth week. So now you'd be on a total of three milligrams. The B12 doesn't need to increase with de-escalation or increase in methylfolate. And then the following set of two weeks, which would be week four to six, you're going to increase further, maybe work your way up to five, even six milligrams. This slow increase in methylfolate allows you to observe, am I getting a little bit worse in terms of my joint aches? Do I feel like I'm getting headaches? Am I getting more sleep disturbance or anxiety? Or on the opposite hand, am I feeling a lot better? Do I feel less anxiety? Am I sleeping better? And that may sound counterintuitive, but sometimes that's just how it goes. And you want to be careful when you're introducing new things into your body so you can clearly observe what's happening and start to unwind that if problems arise. I'm seeing a lot of people start on really high doses of methylfolate, starting with 15 milligrams, even taking as much as 30 milligrams. And while that may be fine in the first week, two weeks, or even two months, eventually, in my experience, that doesn't turn out well. So what do you do if you start having some of these side effects and you're only on the first week, first two weeks? Well, that just tells us it's a little bit too much too soon. So you need to slow things down dramatically. Sometimes you even need to stop completely. And sometimes you need to look more carefully at your labs and make sure we, we didn't miss some of these things that we were discussing earlier in terms of those problems that people have that put them in that second phenotype or second subtype. In addition, I want to talk you through some alternative things that we can use in the case that one, you're worried you're going to have problems or two, you actually did have problems from the methylfolate. So when we're looking at the function of MTHFR, I've made other videos on this too, but one of the main things that it's doing is helping our bodies make SAMe. And there is a lot of overlap in how our bodies do things so that if there's a problem or a roadblock here and we want to get up here, there's a lot of times alternative ways to get there. And so that's what I'm going to describe here. 
So there are three main things that you can use in these cases. And methylfolate tends to be the most stimulating thing. I would say it's the strongest of if we add in these other three things of the four things that you can use for methylation. And everyone's slightly different in how these are going to be affected, but just kind of as an overview in terms of weakest strength to strongest strength, you would have creatine being the weaker one that tends to not be super stimulating and people tolerate it well. Trimethylglycine would be the second one and SAMe would be the third one. Now, these are all supplements that you can actually take. And by taking these, you're reducing the need for methylfolate. Because remember, if we're down here and we're trying to get up here and we have a roadblock here, we're still trying to get there. All three or all four of these uh, methodologies still get you to making that SAMe. In the case where you're taking it, you're, it's the direct path. So so by taking some of these, you're, you're increasing the amount of SAMe that's in your body and therefore decreasing the need to use that methylfolate to make that Sammy. And back to escalating doses, you know, we made it to week six. You may want to stick with that for a period of time, but again, there's subtle things that can't necessarily be conveyed in too much detail in a video like this, but the homocysteine values, lab values, and also how you're doing overall is also something to be mindful of. It's not just like how you feel day to day. Sometimes you'll feel great and then suddenly you, you won't feel so good anymore. And so you want to always remember to go low, go slow, but make sure you go all the way. And so that's what I wanted to emphasize size here is you may end up needing as much as 15 milligrams of methylfolate. It's not very common that someone takes that long term, but in the short run, you may need higher levels of methylfolate in order to function at your optimal. So that's all great for those with the easy phenotype or the subtype one. What if you're in the subtype two where you are having all those health issues? I mean, a lot of times that's why people turn to the methylfolate to begin with and MTHFR is they're looking for answers. Why do you feel like this? Why do you have so many health problems. And for sure, it can be a answer. You just want to be careful and deliberate about how you're using that solution so that you can better map out where the problems in your health are. So if you respond negatively to methylfolate, that's just another clue in terms of what we need to do to get you feeling better. Another interesting fact, if you are in that subtype where you're, you do have a lot of health issues, anxiety, digestive issues, those things need to be addressed in and of themselves. But that doesn't mean you can't take the methylfolate or take some of these alternative methyl donors. You just want to take it much, much slower than what I described for the first subtype. Another interesting thing too, is if you do end up with really high homocysteine, that you have all these health issues and you have the genetics similar to what I described before, something significant uh, that could be impacting your health. And that's going to allow, give you a little bit more liberty or a little bit put you at more ease that yes, you can tolerate this and it is something that's good for you. So these are just some ideas and clues that I use in clinical practice in order to steer someone in the right direction when we're using supplements and trying to get them more towards that optimal side of things. And going back to what I said earlier, it's not a one size fits all. And even though I tried to break it out into different subtypes, there's probably within the subtypes that we talked about, sure, there's going to be someone that's in the middle where they don't have like tons of health issues, but they have some. And so they're kind of in the middle between those two. So we can segment these out in various ways. But the main point I wanted to get across is that there's times when you want to be really careful and there's times when you don't need to be as careful. So we've laid out a lot of things in this video and I've tried to condense some somewhat complex topics into easier digestible format, but we didn't cover everything about MTHFR and certainly about the side effects that come about when you're treating MTHFR or using methylfolate. So you might want to check out our playlist on MTHFR and methylation to get more segmented, detailed information on some of these topics. And there definitely is a lot to know on MTHFR and methylation. And I wrote a book on this topic a few years ago, and you can find the book on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. I also did a follow-up course where we go into a lot more detail than the book on some of these topics as well. And I'll put a link to that in the description as well. So now that we got some of the details of MTHFR gene mutation treatments hammered out, now I want to discuss some of the key takeaways that I want you to walk away from with this video. Number one is it's not a one size fits all scenario. When you try to apply a one size fits all scenario for each genetic alteration that you have, that's when you end up with side effects and problems. What you want to do instead is look at it in terms of subtypes, subtypes of your genetics. Yes. Subtypes of your symptoms or health problems, definitely. And subtypes of your lab metrics as well. And the third thing is if you're unclear, uncertain about what's going on in terms of which things 
things you're taking that could be causing problems or not causing problems. The trick is always to go low, go slow, but make sure you go all the way. Same thing is true with medication. Any supplement that you're taking, starting low and going slow is going to help you draw clear associations of causality of what's driving what situation. And if you're on that easy subtype here, you have a lot more liberty in terms of dosing than if you're someone over here with more health issues. And if you find it to be, you think you're over here and then all of a sudden you're having all these side effects from small doses of methylfolate, you're probably actually over here, especially in the case that your genetics suggest that you should be needing more methylfolate. Yet when you take it, you start having all these problems. Hopefully this video was helpful in giving you a better understanding of what I do in patients. And if you wanted to drill into any of these topics, some of the different tangents on genetics or, or lab metrics, etc., there's a playlist that you might want to check out. If you do have any other questions about this topic, drop them in the comment section. Happy to answer your question. If you want a more customized, detailed answer to your question, consider joining the membership program where I'll have more time and attention to dedicate to your question. Now, one question you might have after watching this video is what are the causes of high iron saturation? And you can find a full video on that topic right here.